Hi, everyone. Thanks for coming today. Um, today's lecture is part of the Conservation Lecture Series. And I wanted to spend just a little bit of time talking about the lecture series before we get started today, because um, today is actually the one-year anniversary of the lecture series. So, <laughs> Um, and these are actually all of the talks that we've had, and a couple have been repeated. So um, we've actually had 16 lectures in the past year. I've had a really great time organizing it and getting to talk to all of the people that have been giving presentations. Um, we've got videos of just about every lecture on the lecture series website. So if you missed a lecture, um, you can go and watch it there. And you can also register for any of our upcoming lectures. This is the list of upcoming lectures. We've got quite a few scheduled. Um, we're scheduled all the way through March, and we've got two in November. So we're going to be having some really great talks coming up. Um, we are going to be having most of them here. One will be out of our Ontario office. So if you are in Sacramento, you can watch that one through WebEx if you'd like to. And. Um, I just wanted to also thank uh, everybody who's been involved in the lecture series. It's um, very collaborative and takes a lot of people to put it together. These are all the speakers that we've had so far that have been kind enough to donate their time, um, taking time to prepare presentations, coming all the way to Sacramento to give their presentations. Um, a few of them have been out of our regional office as well. So they've been great, and obviously we couldn't have this lecture series without them. Um, and then I also want to thank the people in the department that have been so helpful in organizing and putting on the lecture series. Um, we've had people from the Office of Training and Development, from IT that are here every lecture watching and helping, and then people um, within the department that have helped organize or facilitate lectures. So it's been great, and we hope to keep it going for another year and, and into the future beyond that. Um, so today, we are really happy to have um, Jeff Alvarez, who's going to be talking about red-legged frogs and California tiger salamanders um, and management for both of the species. Jeff is a wildlife biologist, and he has been since 1986. He specializes in reptiles and amphibians with an emphasis on California species. He's published over two dozen articles, many of which focus on um, the Natural History of California Red-Legged Frogs and Tiger Salamanders. And he is continuing to collaborate on research projects with other biologists. He has collected data on more than 75,000 California red-legged frogs. And currently, he's working on a telemetry project with western pond turtles in artificial water bodies in Contra Costa County. And I'm excited that he's here today. Um, about a year ago, he took me and a couple other people out to go see red-legged frogs. And that was my first experience with them. So thank you so much for coming today. I wanted to start by thanking Margaret for even inviting me here. Um, I met Margaret and Billy together out in the field. We were actually out at the Smud Preserve in Sacramento County. I was helping uh, Brent Helm do a, a little workshop, sort of a field visit, and a look what we have here in the vernal pools at Smud one day. And, and met both of them, and they seemed kind of excited in the same way that I feel excited about doing this kind of work. So I invited them to come down to a site that I typically do work on in Contra Costa County so we can catch some frogs and salamanders and anything else we could find down there. We had a great day hanging out, and um, I think we are eating lunch and talking a little bit about these kinds of things. And then uh, fast forward about a year, and here I am uh, sharing some of that stuff with you. I should sort of disclose the fact that uh, I, I'm not going to share with you uh, the results of my PhD or even a master's thesis. Uh, I didn't spend too much time doing that type of work. I spent a lot of time in the field. And in doing so, my experience comes from field work, often discoveries, often tripping and falling right on something that I should have seen for years. Uh, but at uh, the point of my work, uh, or rather my presentation, is really kind of sharing with you some of the, of the things that we've learned sometimes painfully, sometimes uh, kind of in an excited manner. But all of these things lead to how um, the areas that I tend to work on manage both red-legged frog and tiger salamander uh, together. So, so uh, my talk will be somewhat informal if I say something odd or maybe not so clear or I mumble it. 
Uh, maybe you can raise your hand. We'll try to get Margaret to give you the mic, and you can ask your question at that point. It'll help me redirect my presentation. I don't necessarily have a personal goal to make sure you hear something that I know. I really want to share with you things that I know that you might be interested in. So feel free to ask along the way, and we'll try to get those questions incorporated into the talk. And believe it or not, it'll work with what I, what I have to present here. They're mostly photos, so I can change whatever I want to say. Just see a friend come in. Uh, so I'm going to start with a very brief natural history overview, assuming that you've heard a lot about tiger cell matters already, or perhaps you even know uh, much of what I'm going to say anyway. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know everybody's level of experience or understanding, so if I miss something or I say something you think is really different than what you've already heard, you, it's one of those times to raise your hand or even yell it out. Uh, but I'm going to give you what I know and what I believe and what I think is, is accurate as of today. It might change tomorrow if I get back out in the field because, as most of us are, I'm always learning. We'll start with the red-legged frog. Um, I'm going to have to look at my own slide here just to remind myself of what I want to say. Uh, in maybe late fall and through winter, red-legged frog adults congregate at aquatic breeding sites. Uh, by congregate, I mean the males start calling, the females show up, or perhaps they're already there if it's a perennial site, and uh, they're there to do the business of making new frogs. So new frogs start out as a little egg mass. The egg masses are attached to vegetation in the water, typically within two meters of the shore edge, typically right at the water surface. But as time goes on, the egg mass will seem to be sinking. What may be happening is the water level is increasing because, it, after all, it's winter and it's raining. So we see the egg masses between maybe a foot and a foot and a half of the surface, certainly all the way up to the surface, and occasionally when water bodies dry a little, uh, they'll be exposed and above the surface. So relatively speaking, they're easy to see. They're within viewing distance of the edge that you're walking. As egg masses mature, they tend to start picking up a little silt because when the egg mass is laid, it's a little bit sticky. Uh, so you can get silt on the egg mass. Uh, the egg masses tend to look a little more like uh, peas that fell in the water. Um, in this case, they're just a little bit dusted by silt that maybe got kicked up by cattle. Again, as they mature, they this is about week two or three, the egg masses now start to actually break apart a little bit and float up on the surface. Uh, they're at the stage where the little embryos, I'm just trying to see if uh, you can see it here, the little, little embryos are starting to take shape. People start talk, talking about them as tadpoles at this point. They're moving around inside the egg mass and starting to make, make room for themselves. Uh, the egg masses are on the surface and warming up fast, so that all the eggs at the very surface are going to start developing faster than the ones that are a little lower, but in the end, they'll all develop anyway. This is a um, post-hatching, an egg mass that looks a little like a big clump of algae. The tadpoles have really just broken free, rained down to the bottom. They're sitting on the bottom of the pond for two to three days, it's the perfect time to go in there looking for egg masses if you enter the water and step on ever, absolutely everything in there. This is probably the most sensitive time for reproduction because all of the little tiny embryos that have hatched out are now tadpoles and just sitting right on the bottom. They can't move, they don't swim, and they're uh, just in the mud. You don't really see them. And the, the tendency is to want to get a little closer to get that photograph or to see the egg mass or maybe to touch it, but you might be stepping on couple of hundred, maybe a thousand little tadpoles. So you want to stay away from these when you see them. And that's probably why I pointed out it's the most sensitive time for reproduction. The not such a sensitive time for reproduction is the tadpole stage. So now we're uh, maybe a month or two away from hatching and you start getting tadpoles that grow at differential rates depending on whether or not they're in cool water, warm water, uh, spending a lot of time trying to avoid predators or not, uh, those sorts of things. So uh, in the upper left here, um, you see a little tadpole, maybe about a centimeter, and then, and I'm not measuring the tail in that, and then a larger one, they're same pond, you know, different sizes because they're feeding differentially. The smaller one might be in a cooler part of the pond, although if this is all in one big scoop. Uh, the larger one maybe is uh, feeding in a better spot, or maybe it started feeding on a little bit of protein because they do pick on each other a little bit. Uh, they'll feed on one another, a little bit of cannibalism. And uh, they'll feed on carrion as well if it's in the water. Uh, carrion meaning usually uh, dead eggs of other amphibians or maybe dead larvae. Then down in the lower right there you see uh, what I affectionately call an overwintering tadpole. These 
these are sort of a, a, an exciting thing for me to grab, but we dip net in the ponds maybe, uh, oh, February, and find a tadpole as big as your hand. It seems like an unusual event. You might be thinking that's a bullfrog, but it's really just a red-legged frog tadpole that went through its entire life cycle, stayed as a tadpole through the winter, and then is uh, quite large, and it's going to come out as a pretty big metamorph when it does finally metamorphose. The upper left are going to probably metamorphose in maybe um, what we we'll just use with the calendar, somewhere between July and, say, October, with a peak around August and September. These uh, larger ones that overwinter metamorphose somewhere around April the following year. So now I have a little display of the sort of the morphological differences in development. In, in my hands here I have um, on the upper left photo right side is a tadpole. These are all from one scoop in the same pond. So we have a tadpole and going counterclockwise, still a tadpole in my mind, has four legs but not feeding at all. It's still got a little filter feeder mouth. Uh, going about nine o'clock in that photo up on the upper left. Looks like a frog by now because it has big four big legs. But this is still not feeding independently on terrestrial invertebrates or anything like that. It's still really in the no feeding stage. It's uh, absorbing material from its tail. It's feeding on that protein on itself. So I still call that a tadpole. It's dependent upon the water. You pour it out of the water, it's just, it's really gonna die. And, that, and then in the uh, 12 o'clock position in that upper left photo is, is that an actual metamorph. So that's a real frog. It can eat, eat independently, breathe independently. Uh, then if you go down to that lower right photo, uh, we're looking at just a one dip net in, in a really nicely productive pond that has numerous uh, metamorphs. That's what we call the stage that is just past the tadpole stage. We just call them a metamorph. People call them post-metamorphic frogs. You can call them whatever you want, but they're a miniature red leg. In this case, uh, that pond was really productive. We could pull out maybe two to 3,000 metamorphs without any problem in a single pond. But another pond might also be productive for that particular pond and have five or ten metamorphs. It really depends on the pond, depends on the microhabitat, presence of predators, etc. In this particular one, it was nice to get a couple of hands full of tiny little frogs that are always fun to hold. Then after your metamorph, you become a little uh, juvenile frog for a few years before you, you reach reproductive age, which is around three to four, depending on your gender how much you've been eating, whether or not you over overwintered. So in general, what I'm trying to say is you can't really say they're reproductive at three or at four, but in that three to four range. Uh, the, the adults are spending a lot of time on the shoreline edge. Shoreline edge to me means two or three feet of the, into the water and 50 feet above the water zone. So they're adjacent to the water, doing a lot of feeding, a lot of sunning, a lot of predator avoidance, uh, spending a lot of time seemingly associated with a pond, but really probably associated with the food that's present around a pond. Uh, they spend a little bit of time active at night, the adults do. They do a lot of feeding at, at night in the summer. They feed on the metamorphs. They feed on smaller versions of each other, sub-adults, but also on uh, mice, tree frogs, whatever happens to walk by them, maybe even a small bullfrog on occasion. Can't really see the frogs in here very well, so I'll circle them. So some ponds have a lot of adults in them. Some ponds might have two or three. Doesn't mean one pond is better than the other, just because this one has 56 and another pond has three. It's really a matter of carrying capacity for that particular pond on that particular year, because different years can be different. So you don't necessarily want to judge a pond based on the numbers. Uh, this pond might be a pond that can support this number of red-legged adults and maybe 2,000 metamorphs all in the same pond, and the pond is about the size of this auditorium, so maybe 50 by 70. But another pond that might be 200 by 500 can only support 10 or 12 adults. It really depends on the pond, and you don't want to spend a lot of time trying to figure out, you know, is this number better, or is this pond better because it has a higher number than this pond. It's really about carrying capacity and microhabitat. So uh, as the ponds sort of go through their pond year, uh, some of the ponds tend to dry to, in some areas for red-legged frogs. Not every area has ponds that dry. Some do. Uh, the frogs will use these desiccation, sorry, desiccation cracks that are in the bottom of the pond. So ponds that have a lot of silt tend to crack at the bottom when they get uh, dried out. Frogs go right down there. They can sit in there for one or two months or even more. 
uh, those little cracks tend to be wet deep inside, about two feet down. Frogs live out their summer down in those cracks. Uh, they're feeding because insects and invertebrates and small vertebrates fall into the cracks. And they're um, picking up moisture from the crack itself. If you dig these out, there's a lot of moisture down in there. So they take advantage of these microhabitats as the season changes and as the habitat changes. They can also use things like uh, logs and rocks and things for cover. Riprap is another thing that they'll use. Uh, small mammal burrows, typically ground squirrel, but depends depends on where you are in the state on which ground squirrel it is and what kind of burrow they might use. They might use a badger burrow, kit fox burrow, or whatever, but I'm really just saying medium to small uh, mammal burrows. And that's when the pond is not wet. Uh, if the pond is wet, they have no reason to leave. They'll just stay around, feed, avoid predators when they can. And this is about what I'm, what I'm speaking about when I say uh, if the pond's not wet or if the creek in this case is not wet, the adults might come out of the creek, get up into the vegetation, feed within the vegetation, or they might, like on the lower right-hand corner there, get out of the pond, get up on the bank, plus or minus 50 feet of the wet edge, feed on invertebrates or small vertebrates that walk by. Spending the whole summer doing this every evening uh, doing quite well, just building up a fat layer before reproduction. So different habitats are very different for different frogs in different areas at different times with different climatic conditions, and that's biology. That's just the way these things are. I've been collecting data and looking at, I probably looked at twice as many frogs as I've collected data on, and I still don't want to say with any certainty what the pattern is of any site at any given time. I think it's always good to get out there and look at these things yourself see what's happening that year because it can change year to year. Uh, some of the stuff we're learning even recently, a colleague in the audience, uh, my friend Jeff and I watched these red-legged frogs climb four or five feet into the vegetation up into the top of this um, it's a form of uh, bulrush, uh, right up at the top of it, just sitting there perched up there. We never even looked there. It was just by mistake, shining your flashlights along the ground looking for frogs just pulled the light up out of laziness and there you see eye shine at your eye level. So uh, maybe in a given site you don't even look up that high, but the frogs are up that high and you're looking at the ground and you say, ah, oh, no frogs here, no problem. But in fact, they're up in the vegetation feeding. Maybe not all the time, maybe not all sites, but you have to be sort of clever like the frogs are. They're changing based on resource avail availability and you have to as well in terms of surveys or in terms of habitat restoration parameters Etc. So we'll switch over to uh, tiger salamander. I'll, I know a lot of you have heard a little bit of natural history on them. I'll give you my version of it. It might be different than Dr. Searcy's version. Doesn't mean he's wrong, doesn't mean I'm wrong. Just means our experiences are quite different. Again, they uh, congregate around aquatic breeding sites late fall into winter. I don't want to say takes this much rain, that much rain, because in my opinion, it may be different if it's a perennial water site, like a pool in a creek or a pond. Uh, it doesn't take any rain at all. It could be a foggy day, and the tiger salamanders will make their way down to the water, get into the water, and the males will just happily wait out the females for one or two months. Uh, so in some sites, the uh, rain triggers their movement. In other sites, it doesn't necessarily trigger their movement. They'll move anyway. If the aquatic habitat is there, why not use it? So as they're congregating in those aquatic breeding sites, they do the same thing the red legs do, try to find a site to breed on or an area to breed. In their case, uh, the, the fertilization is internal and the red-legged frog, ex it's external. The female has these little um, embryos in within her and she's grabbing a little piece of vegetation or a string or a barbed wire fence or whatever she can grab onto and placing them on there one by one in rows of starting with one but can go up to eight or 10 or 12. And I know some, you might hear that they uh, just do it in one or two, but uh, as I said, my friend Jeff is in the audience. He offered this photo. Uh, that's a little more than one or two. So you get this whole string like a pearl necklace in effect. And I mean the kind that uh, you buy at a jewelry store. You just find these on the stick and uh, they're just lined up in a row. They're nicely um, developing on these sites doing really well, becoming little tiny embryos. Everybody's happy when I come down and see these things. It's kind of exciting for me. Obviously, it was for Jeff because he photographed it. And in some of these screens, you can probably start to see the gills and the legs and the tail uh, because the little embryo is developing into a little tiny miniature salamander. 
as opposed to what a tadpole looks like, which is a head and a tail. In the case of a salamander, you're looking at a head and a tail, but there's still four legs. We just don't see them because they're so very, very tiny. And the gills are present. They're hard to see, but you can see it in the shadow right in front of the head of that salamander. So then as time progresses, you get um, these tiger salamanders start feeding on things, anything from invertebrates to each other to parts of each other. Uh, something like this very small one, uh, probably not frightened because it's in my hand. It's not afraid of the big one next to it. It's probably more afraid of what I'm trying to do to it. Uh, but the, uh, the little small one's going to eat its brethren's legs off, its tails off, the, the gills. They just grab and shake and pull it right off. If they can grab a tadpole by the tail, they'll tear the tail off and eat it. As they get bigger, like the one on the right, they're going to eat the whole tadpole. The one on the right is definitely going to eat this little one no problem at all, I, and probably three or four of its friends. Uh, they have no problem eating each other, eating parts of each other. The lucky thing for most salamanders is they'll just grow the legs right back, the gills will grow right back, the tail grows back. You, know, you sacrifice a little. You come out as a metamorph, a little smaller maybe. Uh, but your cousin who came out, who might even be related to you, comes out bigger, so the population as a whole is okay. No problem there. Then you come up with what is a, what I call a pre-metamorph. So a pre-metamorph to me is essentially a larva that is in the form of, or in the process of transforming. And we know this because when you pull them out of the water and they're in your net or they're in your hands, they move with their feet, not with their tails. So something like this one on the right, the upper right, if I pull that out and it's moving in my hands, its legs are so weak and so spindly that it's really using its tail like a fish and it's flopping around inside the net or in the, the palm of my hand. But when you get to something like this size, it's not using its tail at all. The tail's just dragging behind it. The legs are doing all the motion. It's pushing itself through the pond and through my hand with its feet and its legs. And the gills are starting to be absorbed too. So you detect a few of those things. This has gone into metamorphosis. There's no stopping it. If you put it in cold water, that's not going to stop it. It's going to be a little miniature adult in about three to four days. Once the process starts, it doesn't stop. And what, what triggers the process, we don't really know for sure. A lot of us take a guess. Temperature, crowding, uh, concentrations of uh, particulates in the water, con concentrations of other things like minerals. Who knows, really? It's all a big guess right now. We, we have a lot to learn about this. But once the process starts, four or five days at the most, and it's a little miniature adult. Uh, they'll look different color every day. They'll start to, in this case, they'll start from green, they'll go to gray, and then they'll sort of go to brown. And eventually, after about a month or so, they'll start to look like an actual adult, only miniature. And that's what I have down here uh, in the lower left corner. There are a bunch of little miniature ones, and then there's a big one. And the miniature ones are metamorphs from that year. They have the same color as the adult. They look like the adult. And if that big female, that gravid female wasn't in there, you would just think that the scale was a little off and I have a bunch of adults in a tray. So they look like adults. They act like adults, except that they don't go to breed. They wait three or four years in the uplands, feeding, getting bigger, avoiding getting eaten by their brethren. Uh, because something like that pregnant female there, which is, is a pregnant female as opposed to a female that just ate one of those metamorphs, um, they will eat each other with no problem at all. I've had, back before they were listed, I have had them in a tank. They eat everything from crickets to worms to anything you throw in there. I throw a ringneck snake in there and went right down. They don't have any, they don't stop to question it. They just try to eat it. If it's too big, they spit it out. If it's too small, it goes down. Uh, so again, uh, you know, when you see these things in the field, you always want to pick them up, at least I do. I'll get a good photo, maybe you'll do a talk one day. So some of these photos are, all of these photos are mine except for the ones that are listed by somebody else. But part of that is because after almost 20 years of doing this, I still get excited when I see the stuff in the field and I want to pick it up and I want to take a photo. I think it's great stuff. So then the lifestyle changes for this animal because it actually is a terrestrial salamander. It's not an aquatic salamander. This is a salamander that lives in the upland habitat. So the grasslands or the chaparral or the oak woodland that that pond is surrounded by is really its habitat. That little pond is just a pond where it breeds. It doesn't have to breed to live. It can go four, five, ten years without breeding. It can never breed in its life, but the salamander still may be in the upland. So we need to think about these guys as terrestrial salamanders that live in the upland that occasionally go down to water to breed to 
promote the, the success of their species in that area and push the population forward. But it doesn't have to happen. They can live in these burrows where they will go down three to four or five feet, hang out with the ground squirrels or whatever else is down there, and come back occasionally, um, especially at night, and we see this in the summer quite a bit in the fall, sitting at the mouth of the burrow where they're probably waiting for something to come by where they feed on it. And if you spend enough time in the field, you see isopods and centipedes and millipedes and things. They, they detect your flashlight and they try to go down a burrow, some of these little darkling beetles and things. Uh, the salamander knows that's happening and it's waiting right at the mouth of the burrow to eat whatever comes down. So they spend a little more time at the surface than I think a lot of people recognize, uh, but it, it, they go right back down into the burrow to hide out from the summer heat, drying winds, etc. So natural history similarities, the question might be why am I talking about both of these together? You guys have already heard about tiger salamander. Uh, but these things co-occur quite a bit, so we're going to talk about them in this way. And so by way of uh, just summarizing, uh, they have a biphasic reproductive, reproductive pattern. Uh, they congregate in aquatic habitat in, say, late fall and through winter. They lay eggs in shallow water. They tend to, although you can find them in deep water, and often that's because the water level comes up. Uh, both have an early metamorphosing pattern, but they can both have larvae that overwinter. That includes the tiger salamander. So you can get tiger salamanders that have larvae that go through August, September, October, all the way back through February, just like the red-legged frog. Uh, we, we know this isn't just one or two little sites. We've seen this at a number of sites now, so keep that in mind. Adults are highly adaptive to dry areas, especially the uplands. They really have evolved in these upland systems. They're two animals that can tolerate uh, uh, dry habitats. Uh, they just require the aquatic breeding habitat, not to survive, but to persist. So the population has to persist, but the adults don't need it. Uh, the red legs probably need it more than the tiger salamanders, but they can pull moisture out of the ground pretty easily. And then um, they may utilize um, similar aquatic breeding habitat. And by that, I mean to say uh, more specifically, they tend to use similar aquatic breeding habitat where they co-occur. So on my map here, I have red as the red-legged frog uh, range, generalized range. I'm sure we can all pick it apart. The yellow is the tiger salamander generalized range. I know it's not in some of those areas, but sort of the shaded general region. And then the thick striping is where they both occur. And in some of these areas, and quite frankly in many of these areas, when you go to aquatic breeding habitat to sample for one species, you can detect the other. What often I see is people go in to determine what might be in a pond, they catch red-legged frogs, they're excited, they stop surveying. So they don't know what else is in there. Tiger salamanders aren't as easy to catch. But if you really spend a little time on these sites where you're repeating your observations, you go to the site over and over, you start adding up these numbers and it turns out on the about 100 or so sites that we looked at, there was about roughly a 60% um, occurrence of sympatry between these, and probably much, much more than that. We just were like anybody. Sometimes we have time constraints. You don't check the pond as thoroughly as you want. This included stock ponds, created wetlands, creeks, uh, perennial and ephemeral creeks. Ephemeral meaning it dries most of the year, but there are also some perennial pools. So the habitats that you don't necessarily think that they would all co-occur, they tend to use. If it looks like it's going to function for reproduction, it's going to function for reproduction, at least initially. They'll lay eggs. They won't know what's going to happen later, and then they'll leave. So we find the larvae in these sites together, red legs and uh, tiger salamanders. Some of the types of habitats that I want to just sort of give you an overview of a few of those types of sites, perennial and ephemeral creeks particularly where you see something like this, a nice beaver dam. This, this is just perfect habitat for both species. In a creek system like this, we see red-legged frogs and tiger salamanders co-occurring, larvae, eggs, adults. Uh, we don't see the, the adults very often, but we see the red-legged adults pretty frequently. Um, so something like this works quite well for both species. Created wetlands, as I was saying, you create a wetland where there are red-legged and uh, tiger salamanders in the upland, and they're going to reproduce in that pond if the hydro period is appropriate. And it doesn't have to be appropriate to reproduce in it. It only has to be appropriate during the time where they're laying eggs. Uh, they'll reproduce in the thing. So a reproductive site 
is a reproductive site. A larval site is a different site. That's a site that has a longer hydro period, and maybe the animals can uh, survive long enough to metamorphose. But there are many, many reproductive sites in a system. Uh, vernal pools are a reproductive site. They don't always work very well because their hydro period is short, but in some cases they do. Uh, so both species occur in these kinds of things. Ephemeral ponds, old stock ponds that look like this, don't look very good, sort of trash looking. Doesn't make a darn di bit of difference to a tiger salamander. Uh, in fact, you see more tiger salamanders in my experience. Covered my mic, sorry. In my experience, you see more tiger salamanders in a nice trash pond like this than you do uh, in, a, in a very nicely vegetated pond. And we'll talk about that in a minute. And perennial stock ponds. Uh, red legged they tend to do quite well in perennial stock ponds. Tiger salamanders tend to do quite well in them as well. Uh, there are some drawbacks. Uh, that is, that if you have fish in it, it's a drawback. Uh, Red-legged frogs and tiger salamanders don't like fish very much, but you can get the fish out easily. And then it's back to a very nice pond, maybe spring-fed, stays wet all year. It's a great uh, reproductive site, refuge site, uh, dispersal from uh, essentially like a, just a little site that uh, creates its own miniature um, salamander and frog factory. So uh, we see sites like this, a nice perennial pond that is wet all year for maybe 10, 12, 15 years in a row, dries a single year, and then back to perennial, and they seem to do quite well in these kinds of systems. It appears, although I'm just completely speculating, that some portion of the population of tadpoles of red-legged frog and some portion of the population of tiger salamanders have the ability to overwinter as larvae. When the pool dries, that por for a portion of the population drops out, and if it stays wet, it's perennial. They just survive, can overwinter, and do fine. So we'll move into a real-world uh, example. I've been working on this site. It's about 20,000 acres in eastern Contra Costa County. I've been there since 1996, uh, with a few years before that, just sort of sporadically. Uh, the picture I'm showing you here is the, um, the black border is the 20,000 acres. There's a constructed reservoir in the center. And then all these little red dots are aquatic breeding habitat for either red-legged frog and tiger salamander. Now, I, I've read, not so much recently, but certainly in my working experience, I've read a lot about um, things like this where they'll show a map and they'll say, here's all the red-legged frog and tiger salamander habitat. And they're referring to the red dots. But if you take all those red dots away and showed me the site, I would still say, well, all the habitat's still there. Because remember, the tiger salamander is a terrestrial salamander. 15 years it can go without breeding and it's still there and you all of a sudden come in and want to build a pond for it and it breeds in it, now you have aquatic breeding habitat as well as upland habitat. So you have to really kind of change the way you think about some of these things. Uh, if we uh, look at this habitat in its sort of the general plan, uh, the, the placement of this site is such that everything on the east side, which would be the left side, I'm sorry, I knew I was going to do this. Uh, the west side is the left side. Uh, that functions a little more like uh, coastal range, uh, more like um, habitat you'd see in San Mateo County or even on the inland side of the East Bay, I'm sorry, the, the uh, bay side of the East Bay, where the um, eastern side, the right side, functions much more like foothills and grassland hills in the Central Valley. And we see differences in hydro period in the ponds, uh, differences in uh, the timing of breeding, uh, differences in a lot of uh, the plants. And so I tr tend to treat these two sides of this watershed differently in that if I go out to survey or do sort of a, a reconnaissance effort to see if anything's breeding, I might go, depending on the time of year, to one side or the other because the timing is going to be quite different by about a week or more. So you may not see breeding on one side of the watershed, but you see it on the other. If you're only checking one side, you're going to miss the reproductive time. So these things you have to keep in mind as well. This is the same site, but the directions are reversed. So now west is on the right, and yeah, east is on the left. And so you can get an idea of the habitat types there, sort of brushy, scrubby woodland on the, uh, the west side and grassland on the east side. So uh, there, there's always management activities going on out there. Uh, they built the reservoir and had to do a myriad of things for mitigation. But they also do these sort of maintenance things, this sort of maintenance mentality of you always have to scrape a road or build a fence or uh, clean a culvert or whatever. Uh, they're always doing those kinds of things. Uh, they do this in aquatic breeding habitat, in upland habitat, 
And then in these other categories that might be, you know, building park, uh, parking lots, some remote bathroom or whatever, um, in areas where they think it's atypical habitat, but then a biologist might say, well, that's not atypical, that's just atypical to you because you think a frog only occurs in a lily pad filled pond. So um, some of these things are, are, are amorphous in a way or uh, they're moving targets, especially when you work with, um, well, I won't categorize all of them, but the group that works down there tends to have a different view of these things. So they, uh, they do everything from invasive species management to grazing issues to, um, to maintaining ponds and things, and we'll go through a few of those as examples. Here's a pond where they had a maintenance issue. They call it a maintenance issue. I call it a biology issue. Uh, this pond had fish in it. Uh, we came in. They, the water district bought the property. Uh, there were already fish in there from the rancher. Uh, and uh, we had to do surveys, so we did surveys for a red-legged frog and tiger salamander. Over about a six-year period, we detected no red-legged frog. Well, we, we get a few red-legged frog adults, but no red-legged frog reproduction. No tiger salamander adult or reproduction. Uh, and we understood that the fish were probably a problem. So we went in, uh, tried to stain a few of the fish out. That works not very effectively. Uh, so we came in the easy way and pumped the whole thing out, pulled all the fish out. And it included tens of thousands of mosquito fish, uh, a couple hundred catfish, and a couple of dozen largemouth bass. And um, out of a couple of dozen, if there were 30 largemouth bass, two were huge and all the rest were small. The huge ones were huge for a reason. They were eating everybody else. One of the very big ones had a red-legged frog in its stomach. Not so good, but we were getting it out anyway, so not that big of a deal either. So we get all these fish out. Um, a year later, we, I'm sorry, uh, the, we did that in the fall because these kinds of activities occur in the fall. The very next breeding season, we go down and we do surveys and we get larvae. So we're talking about three or four months. And the interesting thing is we knew there were red legs kind of trying to figure out how to stay in that pond. Uh, the adults would still be there. Even if we drained the pond, they just move out and come back in. But we detected over all those years no tiger salamanders whatsoever. We well, have to remember it's a terrestrial salamander. It's just living up in the hills. It's coming down to try to breed. A few of them are going to get picked off. A few of them will miss the pond and walk up the other side of the valley. Uh, these things are going to happen at the scale of a one inch or so when you're trying to walk through grass. But a few of them made it to the pond after we pulled the fish out, reproduced, and we got larvae. So uh, it's sort of a good news story. These kinds of projects work pretty well. They're a little rough on the system when you're doing it. And it's maybe not something you want to put on your Facebook page, all these photos of machines and draining mud and sands and dead fish. But uh, the, the after is always a good thing. Here's another kind of project that we work on out there. Uh, you can see over here on the left side, there's a big head cut in this dam. So the hydro period went from a perennial pond to zero. It went just to a, a, a basic wetland, and it was really wet underground. Uh, so we have to repair a pond like this. You bring in some machinery. Again, it's a little bit ugly when you're doing it. Uh, you get it done, though, and you get it out of the way, and the next year you start seeing both red-legged frogs and tiger salamanders. A bigger issue for us at this site, we have 90 ponds to deal with, is vegetation. So uh, vegetation management becomes an issue about every five to 10 years on some of these more shallow ponds. A pond like this looks great. It's got a lot of red-legged frogs in it. By a lot, I would say, um, 75 to 100 on an average year, and many, many metamorphs varies every year. Excuse me. And then pond turtles and cer certainly nesting birds, tricolors, and all that sort of thing. But it doesn't have tiger salamanders. And the reason we, we now know, although it's, it's anecdotal, but it's anecdotal over 18 years and a lot of observations, uh, the tiger salamanders can't walk through that stuff. They can't get into the pond. And even if they did, two or three may make it. Uh, I can't get in there to survey for them. So effectively, we, we get a zero. So our data sheet says zero for 20 years in a row. Even if a couple of them are in there breeding, it's still a zero because I'm the one counting and we get a zero. So no reproduction even if it's just really minimal. Uh, when you come in with a big machine like this, which looks like you're really muscling around and tearing things up, uh, you can actually clear that vegetation out, injure and disturb a few frogs, um, probably not any salamanders because they're probably not in there right now, but we'll talk about that too. 
Uh, and you get in there and clean it out, and ta-da, you have a nice clean pond. It looks like just the day we built the thing. So uh, we have a few sheep out there because we want to also graze to keep the grass down so tiger salamanders can walk to it. And so you get that site cleaned out, frogs start reproducing again, we can count them at the very least, uh, and then tiger salamanders can also move in. Another reason you might want to do pond maintenance or maintenance on an aquatic breeding site is uh, eutrophication. So you get a pond that's got 40 or 50 years of cattle droppings and urine and a dead cow that's been in there for 12 years and a lot of silt and who knows what because the ranchers used the site before we did and I'm not disparaging them but they didn't really care about water quality as much as the cows as long as the cows could drink from it. So you get inside that, it's a little bit stinky, a little bit messy, really sulfur smelling and you feel like well maybe we can clean this out, make the pond a little nicer. Uh, nicer is a relative thing but it does help because uh, in these eutrophied ponds, you get these red-legged frogs that end up picking up a little bit of a parasite from a snail that really loves eutrophied ponds, and you get um, these malformations. So I'll point out a few. Uh, there are the obvious two back legs there, but then we go forward, and there's two more back legs. This one's sticking right at the bottom. There's one that's trying to grow there on the right, and then there's a little bony spur that probably would have become another back leg given enough time. These kinds of frogs don't last very long. They don't hop very well, as you might imagine. Uh, this frog actually still has a tail kind of tucked under there, so it's trying to metamorphose. It's not feeding on anything, but everything's going to feed on it because it's really stumbling through the habitat. This can happen pretty commonly in really very eutrophied ponds. And so we get in there, clean out all that nutrient material. The snail that likes those nutrients doesn't occur there in any, any numbers. We reduce the population of the snail, thereby reducing the population of the parasite, thereby reducing the occurrence of this kind of malformation. So cleaning, it, we call it cleaning, it's a euphemism, but we clean out these ponds in an, in an effort to benefit the frog. Uh, we're starting to hear about um, similar things happening with salamanders, but we haven't seen it yet, uh, but we haven't looked all that closely either. Now, it doesn't happen just to red-legged frogs either. It's a little Poor tree frog, I really like tree frogs. Uh, this one's got six back legs. Not very good if you're trying to get escape a predator. Predators include other tree frogs, but certainly red-legged frogs, they love tree frogs. So maybe not such a bad thing if, uh, you know, the tree frog's limping along, because the red leg will be able to eat it. But it's also eating the parasite that's in the tree frog. Uh, none of this is really helping these species, so uh, cleaning out these ponds is a benefit, even if it's a short-term mess. We'll just call it a mess, yeah. Well, here's a little bit of a mess. You go in there with a big piece of machine, you scrape out the mud, you scrape out a frog or two, maybe a salamander or two. Uh, you have to be aware that you might be finding overwintering larvae, so be aware of those kinds of things if you're planning this, kinds of a, this kind of a project or promoting it in some sort of monitoring plan. Uh, you have to have biologists on site monitoring this stuff uh, because even in sites like this where he's being extremely delicate with the, that big machine. It's sort of an oxymoron, but it's possible. Uh, you really still need somebody standing pretty close by grabbing the frog. And with the right operator, uh, they don't want to kill the frogs either, then they know they're going to be off the project. You can get a lot done. The benefit is tremendous for the species. So here's a little summary. So, you know, just hearing me say, well, I drove around and looked at this, drove around and looked at that, and now I'm a biologist. We do a little bit of counting and a little bit of analysis. Uh, so three years prior is on the left side, then two years prior and prior to the cleaning of the pond, the cleaning event, uh, one year prior, so uh, the number of, I'm sorry, I didn't even say, the number of egg masses for red-legged frogs declines as you go through time, and then arbitrarily we've just picked a date to clean out the pond, and then you see this increase in the number of egg masses observed. Some of that is because they're more observable, I have to admit that. But some of it is because the habitat is a little more appropriate. We've cleaned out 60% or 70% of the vegetation. We leave some vegetation for cover and for overposition sites. We leave a lot of it there for tiger salamanders to come in. And we allow cattle grazing, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a short bit. But really, we're talking about um, increases that are pretty dramatic if you're looking, about numbers of, looking at uh, numbers of egg masses. An egg mass can have maybe up to about 1,000 eggs. 
So if you have three egg masses, you have 3,000 little little eggs in the pond, but if you were over here on the left or the right end, you might have 10,000 eggs in that pond, and the likelihood of getting a few metamorphs out of there is much, much greater. Even if you have three or four egg masses, you might not even get a metamorph. It's hard to know. It depends on the year, the site, that microhabitat, predators, climate change, my neighbor, who knows. It, a, a lot of things affect this stuff. We just don't know how many things affect it, but a lot of things do. Oops, did I go the wrong way? Yeah. So going back to the site, uh, so here's the overview of the site again. The red dots are indicating all their aquatic breeding habitat. One thing that I like to point out to people is just 75 years ago, that's all, 75 years ago, when my mom was born, uh, the site looked like this. No reservoir, obviously, it's only about 15 years old. No ponds. All those ponds were built in the last 75 years. So what, it, what brought all those red-legged frogs and tiger salamanders to the site? Probably not a rancher, probably not a bait fisherman, because we've tested the tiger salamanders. We know they're all pure. What we think is it's these old perennial creeks. There's a couple of creeks in there. They're perennial in the sense that they have a few pools every year that linger forever and one pond, and that's way over there on the left, uh, so, I'm sorry, in the upper right there, it's sort of backwards to me, um, that blue dot in the upper right is the one pond that's natural on this whole site. So if we try to think back in time, historically this site had two creeks and a pond, and the pond is really a playa lake that gets about one foot deep and is about eight acres, so it functions like an enormous vernal pool. So maybe the tiger salamanders started out at that pond, sort of radiated out to all these sites. Maybe they used the creek. We don't really know, but they could be in this upland habitat for a decade and not need to be breeding. So maybe one year or two years there's a big flood and a sort of a natural pool occurred, and they just persisted over time limping through. And then along comes the rancher. Let me go back right here and puts in, uh, you know, maybe 70 ponds in this area, and the animals just intersect the pond one day. That's really how I see it. It's a little bit about serendipity. Tiger salamander is going up a hill because that's the direction it was pointing when it came out of the burrow. It goes down a hill and it hits a pond. Or maybe it hits a creek that's wet, moves up the creek or down the creek, hits a pond, and there it starts in another breeding population with another salamander that did something different, or similar, sorry. So we don't really know how they all, they got to all these ponds, but they got there somehow. It wasn't through us. It wasn't through the ranchers. Quite unlikely, I don't think they were really fond of salamanders and frogs right now. But you have to think about some of these sites sort of over the long haul and, uh, and, through, and through history, because a site like this, which has quite a number of animals, uh, didn't probably have that many. It's only 75 years ago. If we talk about generations of salamander, maybe five to ten generations of salamander, not that many. Frog, probably a few more, but not that many, not that long ago. So just sort of summarizing some of the work we did in another aspect of it, uh, we looked at the results of surveys at aquatic breeding habitat between 2002 and 2010. Now, I've been out there a long time, but I wanted to look at the, only the surveys where I knew I was there doing the surveys. Some years I would I don't know, I'd be kicked off because I irritated somebody, or some years they would find another contractor, whatever. It doesn't make that much difference because I'm looking at the years where I knew I was at all these surveys, visited all these ponds five times a year, and uh, we looked at them, and over that time period, we looked at 32, we did 3,240 pond surveys over the 90 ponds that were on the site, and we found CTS in 76 of those ponds. This is sort of that habitat that occasionally you hear people say, well, they, once in a while they'll use a stock pond. It's not appropriate habitat because they evolved in vernal pools. Maybe, that, maybe they did evolve in vernal pools, but somehow they also evolved the ability to overwinter the larva. So a perennial system had to be in the ecology of this animal somewhere. Now we've replaced it with artificial ponds, stock ponds that function just fine. Uh, so we find them in 76 different ponds. Not in one year, but certainly we found them in all those ponds. Uh, up to 44 ponds in any given year. And they uh, bred in both perennial and, and uh, ephemeral systems and in turbid water, clear water. Water quality seemed to make no difference to tiger salamanders at all. It's sort of a running joke when you go out there, a clear pond probably isn't going to have much in it. 
because they don't like all that water, that clarity, they're a little bit spooked by all the light. Maybe that's just sort of a subjective joke. But uh, they do well in both of these types of pools from clear to turbid made, makes no difference. And then we found CTS were sympatric 100% of the time with red-legged frogs. Now, I, I have to admit that I, I understand what I'm saying here. If you look at it from the red-legged frog's perspective, they're only sympatric about 75% of the time. But I'm looking at it from the CTS perspective. 100% of the time you look around, there's frogs in your pond. So they're co-occurring all the time with these guys there. So a number of ponds where we observe CTS breeding over that same period of time, just to kind of give you a look, it varies year to year. And I, when I say it varies year to year, they aren't the same ponds that we're seeing them in. They're in different ponds and different numbers of ponds every year. And then we add in something like rainfall, because that's always the first thing people think. Well, maybe the rain was different, so you have a decline in the rain, and then you have a decline in the number of ponds and salamanders. Not always the case. And in fact, I can't see a pattern in here, and I've been looking at this thing for years. Uh, there, there tends not to be a pattern in the amount of rainfall. For us, we believe it's in the pattern of rainfall, when the rainfall starts, how long it occurs early on, whether the CTS have to walk a long way or not, whether the pond's obvious to get to, and by obvious I mean if it's a grazed grassland, it's an obvious pond to get to. They just stream right downhill and they hit the pond. If it's an ungrazed grassland, they're going to bump into a clump of grass, turn right, and go just like a Plinko game. Just go zigzag, who knows where, maybe back up the hill. And all it takes if you're about 500 feet away is maybe one or two degrees off, and you're going to miss the pond. And that's if you're going straight. If you're one inch tall, you're trying to go through grass as tall, it just doesn't work. So we see this absence of breeding in up to eight years in a row at a single pond. So maybe in 1990 they breed, and not again until 1998 in that same pond, same condition. But the CTS are still in the up one because it's a terrestrial salamander. So the absence of breeding doesn't mean absence of salamander because the aquatic breeding habitat isn't their habitat. It's the terrestrial habitat. They're always up in there. And if they're not always up in there, they're nearby enough to recolonize. So it, I know I'm drumming that one in, but it's one that I learned the hard way. And the hard way I means 18 years of looking at this and scrunching my brow and thinking, how is this happening? So if we throw out the average, you can see the rainfall average bounces around. I mean, I'm sorry, the average is steady, and the, the uh, typical rainfall year to year is bounces around the average. It's not really a dramatic drought year or dramatic wet year one way or the other. And in doing, and you get a dramatic drought year, you get a huge decrease in CTS, or you get a really wet year and you get a huge increase. It doesn't work that way because all your rain might fall in December. And then it didn't matter really what you did because all the pools are going to dry out anyway and you're not going to get reproduction. So it's really about the pattern and the hydro period of the, and the microhabitat and the predators and the people who come by after you and throw in the goldfish because, you know, their goldfish is this big and their daughter is now this big and they don't want the goldfish anymore. And goldfish eat these things. So let's see, keep moving here. Can't talk about tiger salmon or red-legged frog without talking about grazing. Uh, this is one of those things that I've slowly and reluctantly converted from um, and to in terms of my perspective about grazing. When I started, I, somebody dragged all the cows off the land, I'd be happy. Just throw on some elk or bison or something more interesting to look at. Probably they would kill me when I'm out there doing the survey. Nevertheless, I was really anti-cow while I'm eating my burger and, you know, having all the meat I could eat because, of course, I was protein starved. Uh, so I'm eating cows, thinking cows are cute when it's on somebody else's property, but hating them on any site that I was a manager on. Uh, then a little time goes by, you know, and even simple things. I'm walking to a pond, and I'm going through grass that's four feet high, and I'm getting covered in ticks, uh, and I'm not liking it anymore. And I'm starting to think, oh, cows aren't all that bad. Uh, but then I get to the pond, and there's nothing in it. A few frogs, but relatively speaking, there's nothing in it. And the pond is choked off with veg, and I'm now I'm getting frustrated because I have to climb through all that veg and getting spiders on me and getting wet and eating cattail dust. All those things that we all encounter, and it seems like part of being a biologist, but it's only fun the first couple of times. Then it's a little bit of an irritant. So you bring on the cows, and I start saying, oh, look at that pond. It, cows have been grazing it, and I could walk right through it. I could see the whole way. No rattlesnake issues, no problems at all. So a little bit, a little bit of it was laziness. I'll admit that. 
But over time, I start seeing the difference in the uh, species assemblages in these ponds that have cattle versus no cattle. Now, we're looking at that right now. I'm working with uh, Dave Johnson Lab in Colorado. We're going to do a paper on this and the effects of cattle on eutrophication and the whole aspect of malformations because cattle play a little bit of a role in messing things up. But the right level of cattle in the right situation, and it doesn't take a very precise number, uh, it will really improve the habitat. So whether your scale is landscape scale, and for me it often is, I don't know why I get called on big sites, but I do, I'm very fortunate in that way, or small scale, you have to manage the upland for the upland species, which is of course the tiger salamander, and to some extent the, the red-legged frog, it's certainly using the upland as well. One of the things that I note when I'm out on some of these sites is I still am irritated about grazing practices. You can see where the st they stop grazing, one's overgrazed, one's who knows what. Appropriately grazed, undergrazed, we don't really know, can't tell. Uh, it turns out that the right side, the overgrazed side, that's not a problem for tiger salamanders. In fact, that's almost a benefit. Doesn't mean I'm gonna promote that, I'm not even gonna suggest I promote that, because there's all kinds of problems that come with that, including erosion, which is gonna affect aquatic breeding habitat. Uh, but the ground squirrels tend to like it a little harshly grazed. Uh, the burrowing owls don't mind it grazed. Tiger salamanders want it grazed or burned off or mowed or whatever you can do to get that grass low because they're, remember, they're one inch tall and they're trying to walk through this stuff. But somewhere in between is probably a good mix for all of us. This is what we're trying to mimic, sort of a bunch grass grassland where the tiger salamanders didn't walk through grass, they just walked around it. And again, that sort of analogy to the Plinko game, if you've ever watched The Price is Right, you know, it's going back and forth, zigzagging its way through, trying to get through the stuff. But that's not a problem. It can do it. And eventually it's going to get down to a pond, or it's going to do a long-term dispersal and colonize another pond. Either way, no problem. It's got 20 years to do it. So we're trying to mimic something that functions like this. It doesn't have to look like this, but it functions like this. So some open patches tiger salamanders can walk through, and some areas where maybe they can hide and get cover, but also habitat that produces good ground squirrel areas, good mouse areas, uh, good gopher habitat, because that's also important in some sites. Some sites don't even have ground squirrels, so you have to promote the gophers. So we're really trying to mimic something like this. Again, not copy it, because I think it's really hard, but mimic it. So allow tiger salamanders a pathway back to the pond. And quite frankly, red legs a pathway to recolonize or colonize a new site, because they move through the habitat just the same way, just not as much, but they're still doing it. So you look at a site like this, and in some circles it would just be, you know, people throwing their cups at me and, you know, booing me out of here. Uh, I'm not saying that's a good thing. I think that's pretty brutal. Uh, but this is actually a pretty productive pond for tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs, despite the fact that it looks that way, partly because the tiger salamanders can get there. I'm not suggesting you need to encourage people to manage this way. I'm just simply saying there's hard to be a too much for tiger salamanders with grazing. The grass gets in the way, but you need a little grass for ground squirrels or for gophers, so we have to find that balance. Here's sort of an example that I've used for a lot of years. We have a pond that's a figure eight, but most of the year it's really just two ponds that sit side by side. The one that's sort of up toward the upper left is uh, one that's fenced. It's got a fence all the way around to exclude cattle. The one down there in the lower right, cattle can do whatever they want to it, and clearly they do. Uh, so one's completely denuded of all vegetation around the pond. One has got all the vegetation that can grow inside of a uh, fenced area. We go down and visit that pond, and every year, every single year, I can take somebody from the Contra Costa Times, I can take uh, Stephanie Yench from the service, I can take one of you guys. We'll go there, and on the left side, there'll be red-legged frogs, on the right side, there'll be tiger salamanders. All the years I've been out there, 18 years, I've never seen a tiger salamander on the left side. The grass is too tall. It's that simple. It's a physical barrier. It's like a curb on a sidewalk. It doesn't take much. If you have X number of calories to burn to get to a reproductive site, you aren't going to spend them all trying to get through grass. You're going to turn around and start walking down that little muddy, cow turd covered slope right into the green, soupy water and find that it's good enough, at least good enough for now. Uh, this is more ideal. This is probably a good pond for both tiger salamander and red-legged frog. 
certainly for turtles and ducks and everybody else, about 30% should have some vegetation on it. So we fence off about 30% of the pond for over position sites and for uh, cover sites, because certainly if you're exposed, you're going to get eaten out on a site like this. And then a lot of open area for cattle to drink, for cattle to also maintain the vegetation. We want them to be feeding on the cattail, stomping down the roots, keeping it from growing, so that you don't create that little fence to keep the salamanders out. The red legs can make it through. They have a tough time, they can make it through. I've even seen turtles make it through cattails, but the tiger salamanders won't. To it, it's just a barrier. It's not vegetation. It's not any different than a big brick. It's, it's a barrier that it has to either go around or climb over. If it spends too much energy doing it, it has to give up. So something like this, and uh, we graze this at about something like, when some areas zero RDMs, which is uh, pounds per acre. So zero pounds per acre, it's gonna happen on occasion, to about a thousand. But the idea is about 300 to 700, and if you know grazing, that really means grass is maybe four to six inches tall in some areas, patches in between, a little bit of bare ground here and there. It looks grazed, you know it's grazed, but it's open enough for the animals to get back and forth, and it's, uh, it's closed enough to keep the uh, silt from moving once it starts raining. Uh, you don't want to mobilize all that loose silk and get it down into the pond. So you have to find that balance. It's extremely hard to tell cattle to graze something evenly. Uh, they don't. They never will. They'll always graze harder around the wa water's edges or where they want to loaf, usually in loaf spots. But it's a sacrifice. You've got to accept that with this sort of um, hands-off lawn mowing effort that the cattle will do. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to use cattle. We use sheep on some sites. You can use whatever you choose. But you have to use something, either that or a mower. I've used a mower on sites. Uh, that's a lot of work, and it costs a lot of money when your consultant's out there pushing a mower around. Uh, cattle don't tend to cost that much. Uh, they're a good tool for this. Using them correctly is important, and you have to have good partners in that process. Here's another site that we did. Uh, so now this is a site that uh, functions like an upland. Uh, because what we have here is a, a pond that's been dry for a long period. I'm just um, getting ahead of myself to, so I remember what I wanted to point out. Uh, this this function is a little as, on, as an upland. It's got a lot of dry bulrush in it. It's not an easy picture to see, but that center patch is a pond. It's been dry for 15 months. It's got a lot of bulrush in it. It's, got, it's a thatch layer of bulrush, about two feet. Um, and the water district here wanted to get some of that vegetation out. So we come in with the machine, and the way we do it is to scrape the vegetation off. So about one foot of the, it's hard to explain, but where the plant essentially stops being a plant and starts becoming a root, but it's still exposed uh, to the air, and then its root mass comes out. So about a foot of soil comes out uh, with that plant. You scrape all that off, and then you come back in and take some more soil out. But we scrape off the veg first, so we know what's under there. We want to make sure we're not killing anything. Because along the way, what you see is um, little burrows in that root mass. So burrows made mostly by gophers, because uh, we chase gophers out of them. And out of those same holes might come a red-legged frog on occasion. So red-legged frogs are over-summering in these little gopher holes that are underneath that matted vegetation. So you have to have a good monitor there. Somebody who knows what they're doing. Uh, this role is often delegated to seasonal people, new people, you know, construction monitoring. But this isn't really a job for somebody who doesn't know what they're doing. You have to be very close. You see my, I'm taking a close photo, dodging the arm, you know, talking to the excavator operator. You need a good excavator operator, and they're getting, there are a few out there now who really do this stuff a lot and are getting it, they get it. Uh, and you need to have your eyes wide open because we're still learning. Every drag we make out there is a new lesson learned. Another site might, what, actually I put this in here for a reason. Um, I'm sure I've, I'm using this as a surrogate site to, show, to tell a story here. So uh, typically when you have a pond that has a lot of silt on the bottom and it dries, you get these desiccation cracks. Uh, if, you, if I turned around, and I will in this next photo, that's the side with the barbed wire fence. You can see the line going across the bottom. So no grazing up in there. It's got about a two foot thatch layer. So what we're looking at is uh, a pond just like this, it's the same pond, but on this photo, it's got that two-foot thatch layer. So now we're trying to, I'm trying to push you along down a story. I'm, I've got a path here, and you'll see what it is. So uh, 
desiccation cracks in the bottom of the pond, big thatch layer. We're out there scraping with a big excavator. And here's what we find. Tiger salamanders. In a pond that's been dry for 15 months. Now I have talked to a lot of tiger salamander experts, and I do this about myself because I'm really no expert. I'm a student of tiger salamanders, even though I've been working with them a long time. Nobody's ever seen anything like this. Why would a tiger salamander, not just one, but seven of them, and seven is where we stopped, be at the bottom of a dry pond that's been dry for 15 months? Well, I can speculate, and I think I have a little bit of experience to say what probably got them there and how this all happened, but I didn't expect it. It was a shocking morning, I'll tell you. Uh, so um, this pond probably filled with a little bit of water, maybe a few inches. The tiger salamanders made their way to that pond. They got underneath that thatch layer and found the water. The water probably dried right back into those desiccation cracks. The tiger salamanders went down in those cracks, and it's moist down in there. There's no reason to leave. Why go out and back up into a ground squirrel burrow, which you may not even find, uh, when you can just stay there? It's nice and moist, covered. Nobody's going to eat you. you got a few friends around. Uh, all these salamanders were nice, plump, healthy looking, not dried out, not skinny. They're beautiful. Uh, this happened about a month ago. So that recent. That's how I'm, when I say I'm learning every day, I mean I'm learning every day. Uh, I'll probably learn tomorrow when I go back out there, something new. Uh, the issue here is though, uh, we had to stop digging obviously. It's a big issue when you have tiger salamanders and nobody expected them. But we were down about uh, maybe two and a half feet past the layer of the roots of the vegetation. So here's the root mass. Uh, the root mass is at this level. The desiccation cracks are going down two to three feet, and the tiger salamanders down in those cracks. So that by the time we got down to the bottom of the cracks, we're hitting the salamanders. So I asked the excavator operator, bring it up a foot, dig a little while I'm watching. I'm standing right there. No more salamanders. Okay, so we know where the safe zone is. We're leaving some down there in the cracks. Might not be all that pleasant if you're a salamander, the things above you, you know, it's 30,000 pounds, scrape and dirt and stuff. Oh, there might be 500 salamanders down there. There might be zero. We don't really know. But we still have to provide the habitat that they need now, especially, especially since we've exposed them. So we put a little dirt over it, kind of gave them some, some effort towards staying moist in those cracks. The ones we exposed, we picked up and put in the nearest burrow. It was the best we could do. Uh, but... Who knew this was going to happen? I, I talked to a lot of people. Nobody knew. I certainly didn't know. And I've, we've cleaned out. I'm on my 37th pond. Never would have guessed it. So still learning. I find it exciting. Uh, I don't write the permits, and I don't have to. The permit that we worked under isn't mine, so I'm not the nervous one. But <laughs> I bring it up because you guys write the permits, and you should be aware that these things happen. So this is the uh, ending effect of that particular job. It's not a very deep pond anymore. It'll be essentially a little shallow wetland. Maybe in some other year we'll come back and try to do it all over again if we figured out that the salamanders have actually gone. I'm not sure how we'll do that, but I'll have, maybe I'll have time to figure that out. Who knows? Then what about those things that you think are a positive? It's like, uh, you know, we were at lunch, and um, somebody was like, you know, one of those feel-good jobs, and it just stuck in my head is, ah, yes, I know those feel-good jobs. So maybe you have a feel-good job. Nobody's really worried about what it's going to do to the salmon or the frog. My friend Jeff and I were talking about this over the weekend, so it came up, and then since I only threw this together yesterday, uh, it popped into my talk, and I'm glad it did because I think it's important. So you have a feel-good job. Yeah, you're building a wetland, put a fence around it because those damn cows are getting in there and stomping holes in your, the bottom of your wetland. You're not going to have a perm you're gonna have a permeable surface, and you can... Wetland's never going to fill, so you have to put up a barbed wire fence. But then, those darn shrikes. They combine, they pick off um, just 75 or 100 metamorphs. Not a big number if you have 1,000, but if you have 75 or 100 and they pick off 75 or 100, not because they're going to eat them, they didn't eat very many, but the barbed wire fence looked like a Christmas tree in horizontal position. Little red legged frogs everywhere. Very sad. Very interesting, too, but very sad. So maybe what we do instead is put high tensile strength wire, electric fence, uh, box wiring, 
there are other options. We can do all those things, keep the cattle out. But it's this little stuff that we don't always think about that comes up in the field. And sometimes we don't know about it because people see it and they don't tell us. And sometimes people see it and they're embarrassed and they don't say anything. But sometimes people see it and they say it. I don't, I don't mind saying it. It was my, my, my barbed wire fence. But it was my observation. You know, I saw one frog. It's like, oh, boy, that's not good. And then I go a little further. Oh, four or five more. Yikes. And then it's, oh, i got to go back to the office and get the camera. So uh, these things you have to keep in mind. Then here's another one. This one we're going to call hypothetical. So um, we have a, um, an aerial photo of Creek X. So Creek X is right here on the aerial photo. Looks like a standard creek in this sort of dry area. There he is. Creek X has um, some riparian. I picked green. It's probably not easy for you guys to see, but oh, it's easier on the screen. Uh, Creek X has some riparian. It's nice. doesn't look too bad. Here's a nice picture of it from the side. I, I like this photo. It's a nice area. Creek X is right there in the little strip of Valley Oaks. But Creek X has some open patches that don't have riparian. And the entity that owns Creek X has, let's just say, more money than God. So uh, they also have some things they have to mitigate for. So they mix those two things together, which are not always safe. Uh, and they decide with the, the help of a, I would say a consultant or two or three, and it turns out there's four, that those little open patches between the green lines might be good areas to restore riparian habitat. Sounds good. I think it's good. Feel good project. I, why wouldn't I want to be involved in that? Well, mostly because I irritated somebody and they just picked another consultant. Uh, so they're going to re replace or enhance the habitat in those red areas now I have outlined. Still sounds good. The problem, though, is the people involved don't have any experience with Creek X. They don't know what is in Creek X. They don't know what might live adjacent to Creek X, what might be feeding around Creek X. They don't know if Creek X is important in any way, except that it's got some bare patches that they can fill in with trees. Still sounds all right. So Creek X gets some trees. Nice trees, no problem. I still am not seeing the problem. Uh, but Creek X also has red-legged frogs and tiger salamanders. And it turns out that Creek X only has riparian, I'm sorry, only has tiger salamanders and red-legged frogs in those red patches. Because those are the only patches that have water. Creek X has riparian on the rest of it, and those trees suck up the water. So what happens if you put trees in all that red zone where there is currently water? And then you decide, well, I can't have my trees fail, so I utilize a pump in the ground, pump all the water out, and feed the trees with even more water. You're taking a lot of water out of the system, putting it into the air, and something gets left behind. Uh, the, not the trees. The trees are doing great. Uh, but the amphibians don't do too well. So now you've increased cover. You've changed the microhabitat. You've added complexity to the creek that maybe they didn't like. You've reduced the hydro period of the creek. In fact, you've removed the water. Not all of it, but enough of it. And now what happens? Uh, the populations of those animals drop a bit. Now, a bit means on a nightly survey with my good friend Jeff, we might see 150 adult red-legged frogs. And that's, that's just what we see. And we're like every biologist, talking to each other, looking at the owl flying by, watching out for the rattlesnake, Oh, there's raccoon poop. Don't step there. It's the normal stuff. So we still count 150 red legs on average over a couple of month period. And then we go out after this feel-good project. Got riparian. Looks good. And now our average is down to two over four months. Now, I've been walking on that creek since 1998. And I've never seen just two, ever. Well, I shouldn't say that. I saw a, even more than two, actually, back when we had bullfrogs in the creek. We got all the bullfrogs out. There were more red leggeds then, when there were bullfrogs everywhere, than there are now. And I think they just messed with a little too much. It doesn't mean don't do it. It doesn't mean it's a bad idea. I still feel good about getting the riparian replaced. But you have to consider much more than I think we even know. We don't know what's going to happen. I've been on these sites for many, many years. 
If they would have brought me into the project, and they didn't, I've just been an outsider. Now I'm part of the project because we're looking at this. Uh, but if they would have brought me in, I would probably would have said, leave these sites alone because I like the way they look, they're fine the way they are. Let's do understory and add some to this existing section that doesn't have water and doesn't have frogs. Maybe it'll bring frogs in. Why mess with a site that already has frogs and salamanders? You don't even find salamanders in creeks very often. So why mess with a site that already has what you need? Uh, and their real intention was just to enhance riparian. That's perfectly fine. I think that needs to be done. But you have to pick and choose what you're going to sacrifice, because you're going to sacrifice something. In this case, we didn't know what was going to be sacrificed. Not enough people were involved, and even if somebody like I was involved, who has a history. I'm not saying I'm an expert. I'm saying I have a history of the site. There's still Mistakes may have been made. They may have been different mistakes. Who knows? Maybe we would have made it better for bullfrogs up, up the creek further. But some of these four good projects you have to think about. I think you have to bring in more people. We have to work more like a, a community to decide how these things should be, should be done. And people like me who are a consultant, I don't like calling myself that, but everybody else calls me that. Uh, I work for a living. I get paid for my advice. But I also play a different role as a biologist. And some people in this room and a lot of people outside of this room know, you can email me. I'll answer your questions. I'm not charging you. I'm not asking for a contract. And neither should any other consultant who knows anything. Because we need to act like experts and offer that information, including things like this talk, to give other people information that can promote the persistence of these populations in spite of or along with these projects we do whether it be a development or a riparian habitat restoration. So I think it's a little bit tricky, and we have to think about these things, too. We don't always admit to how little we know. I'm ready to. I don't know all that much. <laughs> uh, so just considerations as we talk through this, um, maybe if we have any questions. I, I just wanted to sort of highlight a couple of things. Sympatry is common in red-legged frog and textile mander. I believe it is. A common is a relative thing. It's not a precise term. but Let's just call it common. Uh, grazing and upland vegetation management is crucial for CTS. I am 50 right now. If I live to about 100, I'll say it for the next 50 years. I've been converted from I hate grazing to I don't care if I hate grazing or not. It's a tool that is really beneficial to CTS. Uh, observe CTS breeding is sporadic. And I mentioned uh, about an eight-year gap in some ponds between breeding events, even when the CTS are in the uplands. Some of that could be due to the way we manage the grazing. We don't know, but there's still a gap. And if I stuck someone out there who didn't know and I said, go survey that pond for a couple of years and tell me if there's CTS there, and they do a couple of years and they're like, no, no CTS, therefore there are none, it wouldn't be a correct conclusion. They're in the upland. That's where they live. It's harder to find them there, but it's not really a problem I'm concerned about. I think I'm concerned about the CTS. So on average, though, we see gaps in, there's a break in reproduction with a gap of about three years on average, over 90 ponds over about 12 years. So all I'm saying is just because you don't see larvae doesn't mean they aren't there. Then uh, CLS require uplands for foraging. They really do. Uh, Jeff and I are writing a couple of papers right now on this. Uh, a recent paper came out talking about how Red-legged frogs tend to feed on these terrestrial invertebrates. We've seen them up in the uplands for many, many years. We know they're up there. It's almost always funny when we see them, though, because Jeff and I will be walking, and you nearly kick the thing because it's sitting here right in the dirt, and there's a wind blowing by, and it's, it was 99 degrees during the day, and here's the frog right next to a, a big cow turd. When the creek's down there, why not sit in the creek? It seems safer. Maybe not as much food. We don't really know but they're often along these upland uh, adjacent areas. So there needs to be an, a, a buffer, an adjacent buffer to all these aquatic breeding sites, especially those that are wet, for feeding areas. Uh, dry ponds are not always dry and may still be suitable for these animals. And by dry, I mean dry throughout, like dry to the center of the earth. If it's wet down there and they can get down there, they might be living there. We already know red-legged frogs do that. I had a publication out, I don't even know when anymore, that talked about that. And we're going to do one on the rev uh, or sorry, on the tiger salamander as well to get the word out because I do a lot of work around ponds. We want to rehabilitate ponds, but I want people to know to be aware and to be careful. 
Uh, they can respond quickly to predator control herds. We know that for sure. One breeding season. Pull out the fish, pull out the bullfrogs, pull out the crayfish. It's not impossible. We do it on a lot of sites. It's a lot of work. That's what it is. It's not impossible. It's not all that expensive for what you get in the end, so it's a good idea to do it. Uh, they can, um, the aquatic breeding habitat can be manipulated to benefit both, and that's what I'm saying about cleaning ponds or uh, clearing them out or removing vegetation and silt. There's a bigger benefit to doing that than there is an impact when you're doing it. The impact is real. It's big. It's ugly. There, there needs to be some consideration for taking those events, but it's still going to be a major benefit to the population. And nearly all the sites will require management. Now, I know that when you write up these things, you write an ITP and maybe you put a 10-year lifespan on it for a really big project. It's not always fun to try to project out what kind of management they might be doing in 10 years, but we have to think about those things because the site will change and the way we maintain it will change. The people there will change. The history changes with them because the new people will remember something different. It will no longer be the real history. It will be their history. So unfortunately for you, the people who actually have the power to think about this stuff, you're going to have to think about pretty detailed, I don't even know how to pick the words for this, uh, but directions. These are directions on how to keep these animals alive. Uh, people like me maybe don't need so many directions because I think that I have, I'm starting to learn. Uh, but a lot of new people, and there are many, many new people. I encourage new people in this field all the time. They feel confident. They feel excited. And they feel positive about doing things but may not have any idea what they're doing and what they do might make that impact like we saw on the riparian habitat. Now, that, there's nobody's, nobody's at fault in that. It's just one of those things that came together in a bad way. And maybe not so bad because, quite frankly, after being there at that site for so many years, there is no problem that's going to stop these populations except wiping the entire population out of the entire 20,000 acres plus 5 or 10 miles around. These animals survive really rough stuff, five, six years of dry or more. People out there doing some not such intelligent things, uh, fires, uh, manipulation of their aquatic breeding habitat, uh, removal of their burrows, all these things, they survive it. And if you give them enough time, they'll come back. We just have to be patient. But counting a frog at one pond and counting a frog at another pond, they aren't equivalent. You have to really look at all these conditions together, think about this in the big picture. And I think that's the hardest thing, forcing your mind to stay open about how every single site and every microsite might be different. But it's really in our job descriptions as biologists. We have to learn it, share it, and do it. But that will keep these species alive. I think that was it. I hope I ended on a positive. <laughs> okay, got questions ready. So um, I'm going to bring around the microphone if you've got a question, and this is so that the people that are participating on WebEx can hear your question. Hi, my name is Angela Calderon. I'm the Mitigation Bank Coordinator for the North Central Region. Um, so I'm asking my question in light of picking appropriate sites for mitigation. Sure. Um, I'm curious, you mentioned barriers for CTS, and I have two questions. So the first one, uh, barriers to CTS. So could a road or a railroad possibly be a barrier to CTS? Yeah. It's a really good question. I get to ask this one a bit. Uh, roads are barriers if they have curbs, especially if the curbs also lead to a storm drain that will redirect an animal to a different site that it doesn't know exists at that moment. So um, a road is open, I think, as long as it doesn't have the curb. But then there's an additional moving barrier of vehicles, and depending on how much traffic you have, it can become a barrier instantly. It could also become a problem because traffic is not always easily predictable. Sometimes it increases during different seasons. Sometimes traffic gets a little weird during rainy seasons. Uh, those things really matter. So uh, roads are, are a partial barrier in a lot of ways. I think if I've seen upland habitat be separated from aquatic breeding habitat by a road, and the population persists, but it's not the same population. 
it's a group that was already over there by the aquatic breeding habitat that has now recolonized the site. And everybody that was in the upland habitat that can't make it to that site any longer is, is sacrificed. So I, I think roads can be barriers. Non-busy roads, not such a barrier. And it really just, just depends on your site. Railroad, absolutely. Um, I, I was just speaking to a group, a consulting firm, of course, they're calling me frequently about these kinds of things. Uh, we have a problem we were hired to fix. We are asking you to help us with fixing it, really. Uh, so uh, the question was, we have this railroad. We think it, it's in CTS habitat. CTS might be on one side. Railroads are barriers in the following ways. Um, first, CTS can't climb over it. There's no chance. No chance in the world. I responded in that way. What the reply was, uh, well, there's a gap under the rail and above the ballast. And if you've seen railroad tracks, that's true. The ballast sort of settles, the rocks settle. And there's a funny little gap under there, about a half an inch. CTS will crawl under there, a mouse will crawl under there. But the railroads are really anal about maintenance in some areas, and they'll reballast the thing and fill between the tracks, over the tracks with rock. And now it's a complete barrier. And now you thought it was actually open, but it's a, it's a barrier and you don't even know because you've, as a consultant, you've walked away. You said, oh, no, it's perfectly fine. Well, there's a culvert there. Oh, they'll go through the culvert. Uh, you, you have to remember these guys are one inch tall at the most. They can't see 500 feet down and say, oh, there's a crossing, there's a culvert, i got to go there. They have five brain cells and three of them are about reproduction, one's about feeding, one's about walking. So uh, you have to do it for them. I think that is our responsibility. You can't force them to decide. So when I put fences up, I put directional pieces in to make them curve and go where I want them to go because they're not going to choose the direction I want. I need to make them go. Otherwise, I'm being irresponsible. I'm just shooting them off to somebody else's property. And you're doing the same with a railroad. If T CTS hits the railroad tie, it's got another 200 miles of railroad tie before it's going to drop off the rock and then find out where it's going to go. They don't even know to get off the rock. I, I think that they might not like it up there much, but if you follow them, and I follow them at night, they don't make a lot of decisions that make sense. It really takes only a stone in their way to turn them around. The pond's five feet in front of them. They hit a rock. Whoops, and I'm going backward this way. Like I say, those brain cells, I didn't say one brain cell was attuned to direction, just walking. They're just mechanical, moving along. I would, I haven't had a railroad project, but I would definitely consider that a barrier, barrier yeah. So my other question is about CRLS, and uh, you mentioned maybe 50 feet of foraging around the pond. Um, do we know how much Space or how much buffer is needed for that species. So if we're looking to preserve a breeding site, how much space around it would be needed? Yeah. So as you ask that question, the preservationist in me says, well, everything available, of course. Uh, but um, I, I would say that you need to, it, it's a little like the way they think about critical habitat. It has to have all these components within it in order for it to be effective. And that would include an area that is big enough, not 75 feet or 100 feet, but an area that is big enough that has a good foraging buffer, a good buffer for ground squirrels or gophers or badgers or whatever that's digging burrows so that they can have refuge habitat, a barrier that's big enough for them to avoid getting funneled into a predator trap because raccoons will follow a line like the edge of a creek where you have the top of the bank. The raccoons will follow that line just like we do. And the frogs are out there foraging if they don't have enough room to either get into the water or get out of the way, they're going to get picked off. So you have to pick an area that's big enough for your specific site that's going to include that. I would hate to give you a number because I think that's the way we operate, but I would, I would drop out of a project if they weren't giving me 50 feet. I would just give them to another consultant. And that happens on occasion, and other consultants, I shouldn't start disparaging them, but, uh, well, some people are happy to do it, they don't care, or they care in a different way. I, 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 would, be, I would say 50 feet and I'd be going like this. Oh, man. I, I would like something like about 100 feet from the center of the water line. And that would, be, that would be a comfortable buffer to me. Doesn't mean that's 
That means my minimum. Of course, my maximum is probably like three, four, five hundred feet. Because then you include turtles, you include taxometers, and you include nesting birds and everybody else. But you, you're not going to find anybody, I think, that can justify that with a study because I don't think we can do studies understanding all the parameters that are necessary to pick the right width. I'm sorry. I, I know I said nothing. I'm not a biologist, and so I had a couple of questions. Um, one of them was regarding the creek, and since dry habitat is um, doesn't seem like it's a factor that impacts CTS or um, red-legged frog, I'm wondering if that is actually the parameter that caused the reduction. Um, and then um, I had a question on um, the hydro period. Do you know, like, um, how long or what seasons we need uh, water for successful um, reproduction? And um, my third one, I can't remember what it is right now. That's so. okay, because I'll forget too. So well, let's start with your second one. That's the easier question. So hydro period for red-legged frog probably needs to extend at least into July. Uh, so uh, we're talking about to get the bulk of the tadpoles to metamorphose, but it's certainly not going to include any of the type that would overwinter. If it dries before July, you're probably going to get very little metamorphosis. You'll get some, but very little. Uh, the longer you go, the more you'll get right up until maybe about September. So we really have to think about um, the fact that the hydro period matters if you have it on both ends, too. So you have to have an aquatic breeding site that's also wet back here in December. If it starts getting wet in February, the frogs may have already resorbed their eggs and they're not going to breed that year. So uh, the hydro period matters on both ends. And for tiger salamanders, something similar. So if we're talking about maybe November for tiger salamander, it would be nice to have a wet site in November already because the males want to be hanging out somewhere. They're anxious. They're walking around, changing between burrows going into places that, where they're going to get eaten. Uh, they're the vulnerable ones, so they need an aquatic site that's wet maybe in November. And then if you can keep that dry and, or, sorry, wet until maybe May, it would be a good time for them. And, and again, you're going to drop out all those that might overwinter. Maybe no one really cares that much, but certainly the population has some ability to do that. And uh, Jeff and I, who I keep talking about, we collaborate on so many things, have a paper about the effects of of the genetics on whether or not our native salamander picked up that ability to overwinter from this non-native version, and that is not the case. It has it in it. So uh, the hydro period, you have to think about both ends for that. And your second question was, was the uh, dry aspect of the climate or the aspect? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's a good question, and it just means that I kept a lot of details out. So when you look at this Creek X and that particular um, made-up story, so uh, if you walk down there on, uh, let's just say, month, a month in 2013, and you look down, everything's normal. You have four feet of water. The creek's flowing. It's a great site. And then the next year you come back, and there's this riparian restoration project in place, and the water is down to three, four, or five inches. Uh, and you find out that the water dropped in a matter of weeks, three to four feet. That triggers movement for the animals. To them, there's two things happening. They're exposed to predation because the vegetation line used to be where the water line is. Now the water line is down here and they're just exposed. That's not a safe place to be if you're an amphibian. And the fact that it's drying up means it's drying up. There is, now you have to switch on the, okay, I'm in upland habitat mode, and you just go. That's probably to the benefit of the animal. We don't really know. I'm guessing a little bit, but I think I can guess safely. Yeah, you have a question on WebEx, then I'm going to read for you first. Um, Marsha Grestrud says hi, and thanks for the <laughs> great presentation. 
Um, and then you have a question. Can you elaborate on the snails that are a vector for the parasite? Yeah, so uh, they're a planorbid snail, which means they, um, they look like a Danish, like um, you go to Cinnabon, has that little corkscrew. Uh, they, when they get to about the size of a dime, they start shedding these little tiny uh, ribaria. It's a little parasite. It's, um, there's a, several hosts in this, um, this whole life history of this parasite, and one is a snail, one becomes a frog or other amphibian. Uh, and so uh, the more snails you get, is correlated with the, the higher level of nutrients in your pond system. So we see the uh, nutrient increase through, you know, cattle and vegetation that breaks down, these sorts of things, and then a sort of a net increase in the snail over a number of years, and then there's this um, seemingly increase in the malformation. It really means we're e it's easier to see them because there's a few more of them, and they start stumbling or rolling around in front of you or you're netting up some tadpoles and you're looking like, ooh, that one has five legs. Uh, we, I took uh, the service out, Stephanie Yanch went out. We were at a pond that I had never seen malformations in, took a scoop. She said, oh, what's hanging off of that back, uh, the back of that little tree frog tadpole? And I looked down, put my glasses on, there's a third rack leg hanging out of that thing. Malformation right there in front of us with one scoop in the pond. So that pond probably has a few more than we'd would like to believe, but that pond is also on our list of clean out ponds. We're going to dredge that thing, pull out all the veg, 95% of the nutrients. We really believe something in there because it's our perfect tasks. But what we're trying to do is make it less hospitable for the snail, quite frankly. Snail, sort of the victim in all of this, uh, they're innocent on both sides, but they're also getting hammered from both sides. They carry the parasite, they don't want it. We're reducing their habitat, they don't want that. But Sorry, Sam. I'm not a gastropodologist, so somebody else can come and give a talk on them, maybe. Any more questions? Nope. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your talk. That was great. Well, <laughs>